back when I was with the John Fuang. This is after I'd started translating some of John Lee's books and sending them around. There was a group of people in Singapore who'd received some of the books and started a correspondence. One of the first letters we got from one of the members of the group. was from a bank official who was saying that his practice of meditation was to see everything in terms of the three characteristics, see everything was inconstant, stressful, not self. Whether he was at work or meditating, watching the TV, whatever, he was trying to see things and every, everything in terms of those three characteristics. So I read this to John for him, translated it for him, and he said, write back and tell him to look at what it is that's saying those things are in constant stressful, not self, because the problem lies with that part of the mind. In other words, just seeing those things in terms of those three perceptions is not enough. The reason we do that is there's a larger context for that practice, which is the Four Noble Truths. Turn around and look at what it is that wants to crave those things, wants to desire those things. Because the reason we look at them as in constant stressful not self is to remind us that you can't find any true happiness in these things. They change. They're stressful while they change, and you don't have any ultimate control over them. So how could you want to build a happiness based on those things. What kind of happiness could you get based on those things? It's bound to wobble and it's bound to fall apart. We have to keep hammering that message into the mind, because it's always looking for those things, looking for happiness in terms of those things. And you have to keep reminding, no, that's not where happiness is found. Because happiness, to be true, would have to be something that's long-term, with no stress, and is not outside of your control. Based on that question that the Buddha said, it's the beginning of wisdom. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. My long-term welfare and happiness. And those three perceptions are related to that question. If something is inconstant, it can't be long-term. If it's stressful, it can't be your ultimate welfare and happiness. If it lies outside of your control, it's not yours. So you're trying to train that part of the mind that's looking for happiness there. You're trying to develop a sense of dispassion around the raw materials from which you usually build your sense of the world, your sense of who you are, and the happiness that you're going to find in the world. And John Mahabua compares these three perceptions to a stick for beating the hand of a mischievous monkey that always likes to grab things. As it reaches out to grab something, you hit it with a stick say, nope. reaches out again, you hit it again, and finally it realizes you can't hold on to those things. And so as you see that these things can't provide a true happiness, then the question is where else are you going to look? This is where the role of conviction in the practice comes, that if we learn how to let go of these things, there will be a true happiness. In other words, we're sticking with that original question. What I want to do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. We're not giving up on the idea of happiness. We're not saying, well, I guess I should just accept things as they are and not try to have any unrealistic desires for anything 
lasting or true. That's not the kind of teaching the Buddha would give. He's just telling us you're looking in the wrong place. This is part of that duty with regard to the First Noble Truth. You're trying to comprehend what suffering is. Suffering includes clinging. It comes from a combination of clinging and craving. So you've got to look at why do you want to continue to crave these things. As a John Swat once said, we crave these things because we like them. It's our likings that get in the way. So look very carefully at what you actually get out of these things. The Buddha says, look both for the arising and passing away of these things and for their allure, the satisfaction, the gratification you get out of them, and for the drawbacks. If there weren't some allure, you wouldn't reach. You wouldn't grab. You wouldn't hold on. And there are many things that we hold on to. We don't like to admit that we're getting a certain amount of pleasure out of them. Say, with anger, everyone says, oh, I don't like my anger. I wish I could get rid of it. Well, there's some part of the mind that's actually getting a little bit of food and nourishment out of the anger. There's some enjoyment that comes with the anger. And if you don't find that part of the mind and see what that enjoyment is, you'll never be able to let go. So that's another part of comprehending the stress and suffering, to see what incites you to cling in the first place, and to keep holding on, and to hold on again and again, even as these things keep slipping out of your grasp. Now, to do this, you've got to observe the other duties that go along with the Four Noble Truths. In other words, as you're learning to comprehend suffering, there should come a point when the mind realizes this is not worth it. The image the Buddha gives is of that blind man who's been given a soiled, oily rag. Someone told him it's a clean, white rag. And so he's very protective of it. He folds it up and takes very good care of it because he thinks it's a nice, white piece of cloth. And then finally, he's treated by a doctor, gets his eyesight back, and he can see what it really is. It's just a soiled old rag. So this is why we try to comprehend the five aggregates, the six sense media, in terms of those three characteristics, and also looking for where the gratification is and what the drawbacks are of craving these things. To the point where we really do develop a sense of dispassion. When the, with the dispassion, you start letting go of the craving. That's the second duty with regard to the Noble Truths. Now to get the mind in the right place to be able to do this and not feel threatened by the idea of letting go, you develop the path. The healthy sense of self that comes with virtue. The sense of well-being that comes with concentration that also allows you to settle down and look at things clearly, to look at your other attachments first, so that you're ready for the insight that sees, oh, this isn't worth holding on to. All these things that I've identified as me or mine, they're soiled, dirty rags, like that Far Side cartoon of the cow. out in the pasture with a lot of other cows, and so it has this startled look on its face, and it spits out a mouthful of grass. And it says, grass, this is grass we've been eating. You see, the things that you've been holding on to are just that, grass, nothing really worth holding on to, especially considering all the effort that goes into creating a happiness out of these things. Because ultimately that's what it comes down to. Our attachment comes from the belief that no matter how much effort goes into it, it's worth it because the happiness outweighs the effort. But when you really look at these things carefully, you begin to see, you know, it's the, the effort way outweighs the little taste of happiness, the little taste of pleasure that you get from holding on to these things. 
And having the mind in a good, solid state of concentration helps you see that, because you've got a more solid state of well-being, a more lasting sense of pleasure, well-being, that can permeate the whole body. So that compared to the pleasure and ease of concentration, these other pleasures are really not worth it. Whereas the effort that goes in the concentration really does pay off. So you work on developing that even further until you get to the point where you're ready to let go of that, too, and you begin to see that even the concentration is composed of aggregates to which you've been holding on to, and the same principle applies. These things arise and pass away, too. They're stressful. They're in constant stressful. And you see them as not self. And you're not looking at this in terms of some abstract theory of whether there is or is not a self. You're looking at where you're feeding for your pleasure. Say, so this is not worth it. As the Buddha said, if the aggregates didn't give some pleasure, we wouldn't hold on to them. We wouldn't crave them. But we also have to see that there's stress involved as well. Once the aggregates, as they've been shaped into right concentration, have done their work, then you don't need the effort that goes into them. You can let those go. That's when the mind opens up to something that doesn't require any effort at all. The ultimate happiness. Notice that's not the ultimate equanimity. The Buddha never said Nirvana is the ultimate equanimity. He says it's the ultimate happiness. You don't turn your mind into a resigned, oatmeal kind of state. You find that by letting go, things open up immensely. No limits of space or time. And no need to put in any effort. And as to whether you'd call that a self or not, you want to call it a self, but you don't want to say there is no self, because it's totally irrelevant. One of the ways of getting to that state is to, as the Buddha said, get rid of your ideas about existence or not existence by just watching things arising and passing away, arising and passing away. So you see that it's just that stress arising and passing away, so you can let go of it. Let go of any attempt to build a happiness out of those things. And so by putting the mind into a state where ideas of existence and non-existence are irrelevant, they just don't occur to you, there's no reason why you'd want to go around and bang people over the head with the idea that there is no self, say, or if there is a true transcendent self. It's something that lies beyond even the concepts of existence and non-existence. That's the attainment we're working toward. So all these teachings have their strategic purpose, and it's important that we keep using them for their strategic purpose. We're not here to argue. We're not here to establish the one right view about reality. We're here to find ways of putting it into suffering. So remember those three perceptions, and that's what the Buddha called them. They're perceptions, the perception of inconstancy, the perception of stress, the perception of not-self. He never called them characteristics. He never talked about three characteristics. You do a search for three characteristics in the Pali Canon, and you're not going to find it. The Buddha is talking about a way of perceiving that helps you see through your attachments. It helps you see through your delusions about where you can find happiness. So that, that question, which lies at the beginning of wisdom, what, when I do it, will lead to my true long-term welfare and happiness, finally gets its answer in the skills that you developed. It's part of the strategy you developed. Mastering those skills, the, the tasks that are appropriate to the Four Noble Truths. 
because that's what we're doing. We're working on those tasks so that we can handle them skillfully. We want to skillfully comprehend stress and suffering so we can understand why it is that we keep feeding on these things, even though they ultimately lead to disappointment. So we can develop this passion for the craving that keeps pushing us in that direction. At the same time, developing the path that puts the mind in position where it can do this without feeling threatened until it no longer needs that particular position, that particular center, then you can take that apart as well. And when you've arrived at the ultimate happiness nirvana, you've used the Buddha's teachings for their intended purpose. That's what it's all about.